Second Corinthians chapter 1, and let us open with a word of prayer. Father, as we convene as a local assembly tonight, we lift up to you uh, Jean and Nan and their mission to Pakistan along with Carrie and Fassel and all of their loved ones and the believers who are within their periphery. We ask for protection for them. We ask for wisdom as they endeavor to fulfill the service of reconciliation as your ambassadors. Father, we lift up Barry Jeter to you as he continues to recover from surgery and his wife, Chris, and we lift up Jim Howe to you as he continues to recover from his accident. And we lift up those medical professionals treating Jim for guidance in their care. And Father, we pray that tonight as we enter into the study of your word, you would help us to focus and to discern what you have to say to us through the Holy Spirit. And we ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. All right, we are in Second Corinthians chapter 1. And uh, I'm just going to pick it up from verse 11, and uh, we're going to do a very, very slight bit of review tonight. But uh, let's look at Second Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 11. You also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. And we parted last week studying some of the sufferings of the Apostle Paul and a particular phase of suffering he underwent that the Lord Jesus Christ shared with him after he prayed for the suffering to be removed, that the suffering was intended to prevent the apostle from becoming arrogant. And we find that in this same epistle in chapter 12, you can turn there with me, Second Corinthians chapter 12, <clears throat> chapter 12, Second Corinthians chapter 12, and although prayers were very important with regard to Paul's ministry and uh, those companions of his and the believers in Corinth and the prayers were very effective with regard to their sufferings. Uh, prayers are not always applicable to suffering. And this was an instance where the Apostle Paul prayed for the suffering to be relieved, and the suffering was not relieved. And then the reason was given to Paul why he was undergoing the suffering. So let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and we'll start at verse 7. So to keep me from becoming conceited, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, 
a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect, or actually brought to completion, brought to maturity in weakness, that is, in the sphere of human weakness. The Apostle Paul goes on to write then, after being told this, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And I noted last week that we have this motif in Second Corinthians uh, regarding the treasure that we have in our earthen vessels contrasted with, uh, well, actually the treasure contrasted with the earthen vessels that uh, we have this treasure in. That is the gospel and the word of God contrasted with these earthen vessels that are uh, metaphors for our frail human bodies uh, that are mortal and uh, are subject to all kinds of illnesses and sufferings. And so, in, again, in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. So the thorn obviously given in the flesh, that is a figure of speech. That's a metaphor. It was some form of suffering, but it was literally administered by a messenger of Satan, that is, a demon under satanic authority, uh, by God's permission, of course. And the, the whole purpose of this in the plan of God, of course, uh, Satan was doing what he wanted to do, and the, the demon operating under Satan was doing what he wanted to do, but this was all in the plan of God, allowed by God, so God would do what he wanted to do. And what he wanted to do was to keep Paul from becoming arrogant. And this is what the Lord Jesus Christ explained to him later. And it was because of these intense revelations Paul was receiving, revelations of the Lord Jesus Christ from the heavenlies like no one has ever received, like no human being has ever received, uh, because this was a series of revelations which began at the conversion of the Apostle Paul, who was uh, chasing down believers in Christ to persecute them uh, when he met the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus in a vision from the heavenlies in Acts chapter 9. And so we studied that last week and studied the, the uh, principle of him receiving these revelations, these visitations, actually visions and communications uh, 
from the ascended Christ Jesus over a period at different times over a period of, of about 30 years and these sequences of revelation we noted in Galatians chapter 1 you can turn there with me real quickly and review Galatians chapter 1 or just uh, if you don't want to turn just feel free to listen we'll be turning to quite a few places tonight. Galatians chapter 1, starting at verse 11. Galatians 1, verse 11, where the Apostle Paul writes to the believers in Galatia, For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel, that is, the message of good news, that was preached by me is not man's gospel, for I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. And gospel is a word that is used in the New Testament in both a general and a specific sense. And the Apostle Paul actually referred to the, the good news. It means a, a message of good news. And Paul referred to uh, the gospel in a very specific sense as being the one committed to him by directly by revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ in Galatians 1 verse 12. He also referred to it as my gospel, that is his gospel, using the first person uh, pronoun singular in Romans 2.16, in Romans 16.25, and in 2 Timothy 2 verse 8. And this gospel was the revelation of Christ Jesus to the Apostle Paul of the details of what Christ had accomplished on the cross for the salvation of the human race. It involved the principle of the imputation of God's righteousness, that is the crediting of God's righteousness to the sinner who simply believes in Romans 4 or 5 to the one who does not work but believes on him who justifies the godless that is the, the unbeliever or translated ungodly the, the unbeliever so the person who d does not work but believes on the one who justifies, and we'll get to that word in a minute, the one without God, that person's faith is counted for righteousness. And what that means is that the believing sinner, the instant a, a sinner believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, believes that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, God's anointed, the one God sent, uh, the one that, that paid the penalty on the cross of our sins, the person who believes the testimony of God regarding the identity of his Son, Jesus Christ, is instantly saved because that person instantly receives the crediting of God's very own righteousness to his or her account. In other words, the believer on Christ, be it a he or a she, the person who believes on Christ instantly receives the accounting of, 
of God's righteousness. And remember that God is eternal. God is eternally righteous. And so that person receives the very righteousness of God forever because it is eternal righteousness. And that has always happened. Paul in Romans chapter 3 explains how it was always possible to happen because God uh, passed over before Christ actually went to the cross uh, the sins of, of members of the human race who lived previously. And he could only do that because Christ would go to the cross. And so, therefore, Genesis 15, 6, uh, Abraham believed and it was accounted to him for righteousness. But then also Paul brought forth in the gospel committed to him many doctrines, but uh, logically following the doctrine of the imputation of God's righteousness to the believing sinner is the doctrine of justification, which is the formal declaration from God the judge at the bench of the Supreme Court of Heaven, if you will, to, to, uh, to see it from human viewpoint, but God the righteous judge, totally righteous, totally just. And to the one who does not work but believes on the one who justifies the one without God, his faith is counted for righteousness. God justifies the believing sinner the instant that he recognizes the crediting of his own righteousness on that sinner's behalf. And so it's a forever thing. That's the doctrine of eternal security, and we understand that from many avenues of Scripture, but two of the avenues are that God is eternally righteous and God is eternally just. And so, therefore, if he bestows his eternal gift of righteousness on someone, that is forever and cannot be undone. God is also immutable. He is unchanging. And his declaration of justification, that is, his declaration that the believing sinner has, it's like a declaration in court of not guilty, only it really goes beyond that. It's a declaration from the Supreme Court of Heaven that that person is as righteous as God is. And because that declaration of God's righteousness comes from an eternal God, we have eternal security. That simply put means once saved, always saved. You cannot lose your salvation. And so... Many aspects of what Christ accomplished on the cross were given to the Apostle Paul. And they had not been given to the other apostles previously. Their mission was to Israel and to the other nations through Israel, but their program after Christ went to the cross and rose from the dead was to continue the program uh, 
in which they had been involved, the announcement of the coming kingdom of God, the prophesied kingdom of God, which will be fulfilled in the future. And they were commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ to continue with that message. Only now, it was after Christ had gone to the cross and died on the cross and had been resurrected and was now available to return and establish his kingdom, which he will do in the future. And that gospel of the kingdom will Again, after the rapture of the Church of the Present Dispensation, uh, the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed again, Revelation 24, verse 14, into all of the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. In the meantime, the apostles were in Jerusalem, they hadn't received the revelation that the Apostle Paul had received. Their experience with Christ had been limited to their knowing Christ for three and a half years while Christ was still in his yet unglorified body during Christ's earthly ministry, and then they had some exposure to Christ after Christ had gone uh, to the cross and had risen from the dead, but that exposure was limited, and they did not have these visions of Christ from the heavenlies as the Apostle Paul had. So in Galatians chapter 2, and verse 1, Paul writes, Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles. Then he gives the why he did this. In order to make sure I was not running or had run in vain. In other words, the other apostles didn't have the details of what Christ had accomplished on the cross yet. And they were going on with a program that they were told to uh, continue the Apostle Paul had been raised up and was going forward with what was given to him by direct revelation. It was not the same message as the other apostles were preaching. And so the Apostle Paul was called upon by direct revelation of Jesus Christ to get going to Jerusalem and meet with them and let them know what he was preaching, what had been going on in his ministry. And Paul reports on this private meeting before uh, the big public conference took place in his letter to the Galatians, and then Luke the great physician and historian and a writer of the Gospel of Luke as well as the, the book of Acts. Uh, and Luke was a stickler for detail. And he writes about the public aspect of the meeting, the, the, the public proceedings of the meeting, the public minutes of the meeting, if you will, of, of the, the entire conference, not the private meeting of which Paul wrote. And we find that in Acts chapter 15. You could turn there with me, Acts chapter 15. <clears throat> 
And in Acts chapter 15, starting at verse 1, But some came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now this was a movement among which, of the, among which many of the Pharisees were involved. The Pharisees were actually a sect. The movement was called Judaism, or uh, those who participated in the movement were called Judaizers, and many of them were Pharisees, but uh, this was a movement that came about among those who had believed on the Lord Jesus Christ but thought it necessary to hold to the law of Moses. And it, it can be understood why they thought it necessary to do that as Jews because no other instructions had yet been given. But they also, in their message to the Gentiles, they believed that uh, unless... The, the male Gentiles, that's who it's talking about, the male Gentiles were circumcised upon their faith in Christ according to the custom of Moses. They couldn't be saved. Then let's read verse 2. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers, and that is actually, uh, this translation renders this some believers, uh, that is actually a verb, some Having believed, it is uh, in the uh, imperfect, or rather the perfect tense. So some who had believed with continuing results, the perfect, the perfect tense is uh, the description of an action which has been completed but has existing results. So some who had believed with the existing results that, that they were believers, who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. So this kind of begs the question, can people who believe that you have to keep the law of Moses to be saved actually even be saved themselves? And the answer to that is yes, very clearly in the Bible. These were believers who brought this up. Yes. At some point, they had believed on Christ. They just had a, a horrible misunderstanding that keeping the law of Moses and circumcision was somehow related to salvation. And that horrible notion was held by the Jews for their term under the law of Moses, which was approximately 1,500 years before Christ went to the cross, the, uh, between the, the time uh, 
the law was given to Moses and Christ went to the cross, that was roughly 1,500 years. And the Jews had always misunderstood the law of Moses and had assumed that keeping the law of Moses had something to do with being, being eternally saved. Now, not all of them, but some of them. It's very clear, not all of them, very clear, not David, because Paul brings that up in Romans chapter 4. And so there were wonderful and notable exceptions, like the prophets and, you know, the real prophets. And, and uh, uh, there were a number in Israel who did understand uh, the need for substitutionary work on their behalf, which was the reason that the Levitical sacrificial system was given, and the reason the tabernacle was built with the, with the furniture of the tabernacle, and uh, the, the animal sacrifices, the five great Levitical sacrifices were actually to teach Israel that they could not make it by the law. They could not be justified by, by the law. But in Romans 10 verse 3, but being ignorant of God's righteousness and not submitting themselves to the righteousness of God, they attempted to establish their own righteousness. How did they do that? By keeping the law. They thought keeping the law was the key. So unfortunately, that, that has even been brought into the, the present day of, of uh, what should I say, Christian dumb. Not, not Christianity, but Christian dumb. Um, uh, cultural Christianity. But getting back to this question, can people who believe you have to keep the law of Moses to be saved actually be saved themselves? Yes, these people were. They just did not understand what the law was about. And they were like those who, for the past 1,500 years, had not understood what the law was about. But to bring this into a more present application, can lordship theology proponents be saved? And what uh, lordship salvation theology teaches is that in order for a person to be saved, he or she must turn from their sins. Any combination or all of these things must turn from their sins, must uh, submit to Christ's lordship, must uh, make Jesus lord of their lives, must bear fruit of discipleship, bear spiritual fruit of discipleship, must make a public profession of their faith. They place all, depending on who it is, who, who these false teachers are, they, they place all kinds of different, uh, different conditions on believers for salvation. You must feel sorry for your sins. You must uh, turn from your sins and so forth. And, and these issues they bring up, many of them are important issues 
after one is saved for discipleship, that is, for following the Lord, but they have nothing to do with salvation. So can lordship salvation theology proponents be saved believing the things that they believe? Yes, of course they can. And so I, some of their uh, leading teachers, uh, uh, J- uh, John MacArthur Jr., or James, what, James MacArthur Jr., um, R.C. Sproul, um, uh, there, are, there are a whole bunch of them. I've, fortunately, I've forgotten the names of, of quite a few of them, but, uh, th- but they're still out there in, in full force. And are they believers? I've, I've no doubt that they at one point believed on Christ and are saved. But their teaching is horrible, absolutely horrible. And the same with the the reformers. Uh, John Calvin and Theodore Basil, who followed Calvin. And these people taught that you could not uh, be regenerated, or, or I'm sorry, you could not believe the gospel until God regenerates you. So it isn't really believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. It is God regenerates you so that you can believe because they went in for the old Augustine double predestination uh, I don't want to use as strong a word as as I really want to use I'll just say hoax um, that God has predestined certain people to heaven and certain other people to everlasting condemnation. And uh, that, of course, is false doctrine. But was John Calvin a believer in Christ? Most likely. And John Calvin himself actually... Uh, was responsible through his influence for the execution of uh, 50-some people. But as far as I know, he was a believer in Christ. We'll see him in heaven. And so, uh, Martin Luther, a great reformer, wrote a lot of great things, but Martin Luther uh, became bitterly anti-Semitic in his later years because he did not understand the dispensational teaching of the Bible, specifically Romans 9, 10, and 11. And so he turned very bitter and... Uh, His doctrine lacked a a lot of truthfulness in areas, but a believer in Christ. And uh, thank God he recovered the the very truth of justification for salvation by faith. But it's miraculous. Can people who believe very strange things actually be saved and going to heaven? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. In fact, turn with me in John chapter 19, the gospel of John. John. 
And I'll tell you what, we're going to, uh, that is where we will turn for our second session because we need to wrap up this first session with prayer, which we will do right now, and we will convene in 10 minutes for our second session. Let's close this session in prayer. Father, thank you for what you've given us so far. We thank you, above all, for the giving of your Son. And our thanksgiving is in that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whosoever would believe on him would not perish but have eternal life. We thank you for the simple truth of that good news for all mankind. And we ask that our second segment of teaching tonight would be beneficial toward the building up of our spiritual lives and toward glorifying you. And we ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Okay, uh, 10 minutes and we'll see you again.